we're going to go ahead and get started with a study that probably not too many of you heard a sermon on fasting before. Have you? Anybody ever heard? Yeah, fasting's my favorite. This is awesome. Probably not too many of you heard one, but you're going to hear one today. We're going through the Lenten season, which is good. It's very good. But the Lenten season is premised on fasting. I was talking to my friend Jeff. Jeff is um, in the 10th grade. Jeff was, he, he took an IQ test to see what his IQ was, 10th grade. And he, he gets the results back and he goes, yeah, I've got an IQ. I was, well, yeah, good, glad you got an IQ. It's 170. I'm like, really? You couldn't have spread the wealth at all? <laughs> you got 170, I'm like, one. Point two, I don't know. And Jeff's like 170. I was like, well, well, at the time I didn't know what that meant. And I was like, so what does that mean? He said, well, 140 is genius. <laughs> I was like, that's just not fair. Well, a couple of days ago, my, man, he's gone through some tough stuff. A year ago, his mother-in-law died and they had a great relationship. She was 52. She died of cancer, never smoked, lung cancer. The Lord took her home. Six months later, his three-month-old niece died, loved her to death. And I've been praying for Jeff, and I've been praying for Jeff, and I've been lifting him up. And I said, Jeffrey, you want me to pray for these things? Have you ever fasted and prayed about it? And he said, well, I don't really, well, what's the point of fasting? I said, well, you, you can pray while you eat, or you can pray while you're starving. You're still praying, right? It's the same thing. Well, not exactly, pal. He's like, oh, okay. So smart Jeff, IQ 1 billion Jeff, doesn't know what... Fasting and praying really accomplishes in our lives. So I thought, you know, it's not a bad idea. We're going to go through what the purposes of fasting are. We're going to give you four biblical examples. If I can get through it in time, we're going to give you four biblical examples of what fasting looks like, what it can do, what it accomplishes in your walk with the Lord. Okay? Let me ask you ladies a question. How many of you all have significant others? Boyfriend, husband, that kind of thing. That kind of deal. All right. Show a hand. Um, <laughs> she's happy. I like him. He's pretty. Look at him. Um, let me ask you ladies a question. By show of hands, how many of you all get very, very excited when you have a, a lovely romantic evening planned and your husband shows up 45 minutes late in blue jeans and a t-shirt to a suit and tie restaurant? Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? Don't you love that? Oh, it's wonderful. How many of you ladies, by a show of hands, I want to see your hands, enjoy when your husband shows up and talks about nothing but the Steelers? And that would be zero. Okay. How many of you ladies, on the other hand, show of hands, don't plan anything? Yeah, oh, there, we got a hand already. I'm not even done yet. Don't plan anything. And your husband says, okay, I want you to meet me here at 7.30. All things are off. I've done nothing today but plan our evening. I even took a sick day to plan our evening. You did? So sweet. Right? See? Oh, I'm tearing up already. I, I, I took a sick day to plan our evening. I've canceled all my events. I was supposed to hang out with Smart Jeff tonight, but we're not going to because I would rather be with you. Show of hands, come on. Okay, so we're getting some hands here. Note to self, guys. All right, write that one down. Cancel everything. Go be with the girl. You like the girl. Steelers don't matter at that point. You like the girl. When we fast and when we pray, we say essentially the same thing. There is much in the heart of the Lord that is in the heart of a woman. When you say, Lord, I don't care about anything right now. I'll tell you what. I'll give up food if you'll just show up in my life. I'll give up anything if you'll just be here. If you'll just talk to me. I read your word and it might, might as well be Chinese. You ever have moments like that? Have you ever had seasons in your life like that where it doesn't matter how hard you try to connect with the Lord? It's just, it's a Greek village in this Bible. You pray and your word's just kind of right there in the floor. 
Nothing happens. They just kind of bounce off the ceiling and land right back on the floor. You listen to worship music and nothing happens. You beg the Lord to show up in your life, to move in a situation. Nothing happens. You ever been in that kind of position? Yeah, I know you have. If you've been a believer for more than 12 seconds, you've been in that kind of position. First thing we're going to look at comes out of uh, Mark. Jesus, well, it's a great example. Because, uh, well, just because it is. Uh, it comes out of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 12. If you have your Bible, turn to it. Mark 1, verse 12. If, if, if you're studying about how the Lord fasted, how He gave us that example of fasting, this is a great place to start. You've been, you've been kind of going through, Brother Witt talked about in the first week, this is the Lenten season, means lengthening of the days, where we give something up as we approach Calvary. As we approach this place that took away our sin, we recognize the simultaneous beauty and the horror of it. And it's a time of humbling ourselves because we give something up. Some of us might have given up chocolate. Some of you might have given up uh, I don't know, American Idol. Some of you might have given up your iPod, something like that. But I'm going to encourage you. We're not talking about chocolate today. We're talking about something a little bit deeper. We're talking about a real live, Christian, heartfelt, God, you got to show up or it's all going to fall apart fast. Jesus, Jesus gives us the example. We're going to read from Mark, but I'm going to quote from Luke and from Matthew. This is the primary text for just now, okay? Verse 9, chapter 1. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Okay, I'm not even to where I want to be, but I'm going to preach on this. Torn open doesn't mean, oh, kind of a moment. It's not a happy Wow, that's beautiful kind of... It's a Japanese earthquake frightful moment. Literally, it's rended. It's two pit bulls with a silken garment tearing it apart. Fabric of time and space, boom. And all of a sudden, the fullness of God is revealed to the gerbils. And they're afraid. Heaven is torn open. This is where Jesus is coming from. You know, in Joseph's life, the Lord said, Joseph, I'm going to give you a vision. You are, you are an, a, a, an esteemed person. Here's a vision. Here's a prophecy. All the sheaths are going to bow down to you. You're going to be the king. I don't know, or you don't know exactly what you're going to be king of, but you will be the king. You just hang on to that, pal. What happens to Joseph? First thing he does, he gets sold into slavery. Can it get any worse? No. Yeah, he goes into prison. How long was he in prison? 11 years. I wonder how many times he gave up on that vision. 1,000, 2,000 times. I would have done it at least every day. Lord, what did you bring me here for? So we have the same example. Jesus is getting prepared for ministry. The heavens open up. The Lord speaks audibly to everyone. The Holy Spirit descends on him. And what happens next? Verse 11, a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And immediately, at once, the Holy Spirit sent him into the desert. If you read in the, uh, the book of Luke, it's, he didn't send him out into, he sent him up to a higher plane, into the desert. When you have a time in your life when the Holy Spirit feels like you are just being chided, you need to pray. You need to spend time on your knees. Follow the example of Jesus. Don't give up chocolate. Give up food. Stick to water. It is not something the American church does often. But I can guarantee you, if you fast and you pray during this Lenten season, for one day, give it a day. No food. Wake up hungry, go to bed hungry. Then eat the next day. You will encounter the Lord in ways you will never experience Him otherwise. I can solemnly promise you that. 
And I wonder how many prayers in our lives never get answered because we say, Lord, I just ask that you bless so and so, but, but uh, just, just be with them in Jesus' name. And then we go about our day-to-day lives. And that's all we give Him. How many more prayers in our lives would be answered if we said, Lord, you've got to show up. He's dying over there. Their marriage is breaking apart. And I'm not eating until you move. I wonder how many of our prayers would get answered if we were that heartfelt about our prayers. Father, your activity in my life is more important than food. i got to have you. So Jesus goes out into the desert for 40 days. Let me give you some... Um, if, don't, if you feel like you need to do a 40-day fast, consult a physician first. Okay? Your body literally goes into starvation mode, meaning starts eating its flesh, not body fat, muscle tissue, at 28 days. It's excruciating. 40 days, 12 more. I'm not waiting until, I'm, until I feel like the Holy Spirit has properly prepared me for ministry. This is what Jesus is doing. Fasting connects you to the heart of the Lord in ways that you cannot get connected otherwise. When you give something up and say, Lord, I love you. When you give something up for your wife and say, I've canceled everything today. I just want to be with you. Her heart is warmed and she draws close to you. When you say, Lord, I just want to be with you. I've given up everything for us today, for this week, for this season in my life. I just want to be with you. His heart is likewise warmed. And he will not stay far from you. Do you have a time of brokenness? Do you have a season of brokenness where you feel like you're in the desert? Stay there. Fast and pray. And you wait for the activity of the Almighty God to come shining through in your life. Let me tell you what happens when you fast and pray. A lot of times, a lot of times the Lord says no. The second person is this. The second person is David. 2 Samuel, we get a picture of David. He has sinned. He slept with Bathsheba. Actually, some scholars would say he raped Bathsheba. He took her because he's a king, and I can do that. He took advantage of the anointing the Almighty God had given him as king and took another man's wife and then murdered that man. And she conceived. Nine months later, the Lord says to David, David, I love you. But I made that child, and I'm taking that child. You have sinned against me. The sin is far from you. I have forgiven you. But that child is mine. And to judge you and your actions, I'm taking him to be home with me. And what's the first thing David does? What's the first thing David does? He goes and he lays down on the floor like a four-year-old kid who had his lollipop taken away, and he cries out to God. See, this is the one area in Christendom, Christianity, in your walk with the Lord, where you are allowed to be an aristocratic little kid. Prayer is the place where you're allowed to go, I want it. Just come on. Fine, I'm not eating. No. And if you read the text, David probably didn't drink anything either. No, you keep the kid. I'm keeping the kid. What happened? The child still died, didn't he? The Lord said, David, no. He's mine to take. Sometimes when you fast and you pray and you beg of the Lord, please. He says, no. A lot of times, as in the life of Job, Job is covered in boils. He probably can't speak too well because the inside of his mouth is raw. Hasn't had a romantic night with his wife for years. His friends have all left him. His children are all dead. His estate is in shambles. And he is begging the Lord, please, where are you? Why are you doing this? What does the Lord do? The Lord just comes through and says, Job, let me ask you some questions. Did you tell the ocean it can only come this far? Do you direct lightning bolts? Where does the wind come from? Do you know that? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the horse runs headlong into the wind and gets excited because it's going into battle, did you give it that strength? 
No, that was me. A lot of times when you fast and you pray and you beg of the Lord because I've got to have you in my life, he doesn't give you a yes answer. He doesn't come through and make it all happen the way you want it to. Not always. What you will get undeniably is him. And that's better than an answer. It's better than a, the waters parted. Job got God. You will get the heart of the Lord. I encourage you, if you've never done a fast, and I'm not talking chocolate, I'm talking serious, serious fast. Do one. You will not be disappointed. I just did a fast. I'm going to trip over this thing or knock it off the stage. Please excuse me for just one, one moment. I just did a fast um, about a month ago. I was begging the Lord, where do you want me to go to seminary? I really want to go to seminary. I was like, I don't know. I can't hear you. So I went waters and veggie only. I did a Daniel fast. If you're diabetic and you say, I can't fast because I have to have some blood sugar. Waters and veggies are a great way to go. This is a real practical fast. We're getting to the nitty gritty of it here. It's a really, really practical fast. It's a good way to start. Try it for one day. And I guarantee you at the end of the day, you will be closer to the heart of the Lord. And you'll go, I wonder if I could do a no food fast. I think I should. You won't be disappointed. I was doing this fast, I don't know, it was a couple of days long, and I was begging of the Lord, please, 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 come through for me. Give me, give me an answer. And he didn't. It's, sometimes it's just the way it goes. He didn't. But what he did was he changed my heart so that I could receive direction. The entire week, I guarantee you, the one lesson the Lord kept bringing through my mind, through the circumstances, through the word, was be humble. Be humble. Humility is a good thing. And we live in a culture that says you have to be number one all the time. If you watch 12 seconds of Jersey Shore, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you watch any sporting event, you'll know what I'm talking about. We live in a country where everybody who wants to be number one has a shot. It's great. But as a Christian, you don't make your way. The Lord does. You don't make the paths straight. You don't remove the stones out of your own way. The Holy Spirit prepares the way for you. And as you fast and you draw close to the heart of the Lord, you say, please give me an answer. He says, no, I'll give you me. He's begging you to use your faith. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, not the people, the book of Hebrews says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let me ask you a question. What's the point of having all the answers? You don't get to use your faith. Faith isn't any good unless it's like a rubber band stretched. Your faith is pointless unless it's just stretched almost to the point it's getting ready to snap. You ever seen a rubber band that hadn't been used for a year? You kind of go... Ooh, you can really stretch this thing now. The Lord's going to bring you into places. Where's the first place he brought Jesus? The desert. What's the first thing he did with Joseph when he gave him a prophecy? Put him into slavery. What's the first thing he did with Gideon when he said, I want you to lead people into battle? Took away most of his army. The very first thing he did to Moses when he said, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. He said, go live in the desert and tend sheep. They're not even your sheep, but go tend them. Who's are they? Your father-in-law. Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> They're not even your sheep, Moses. Go tend them. The Lord will never exalt you before he humbles you. Do you hear me? You will never be exalted before you are humbled. Spend three meals. Okay, two meals. Fasting. With a simple prayer, Lord, I'm here and I want to hear from you. Come and meet me. I love the story of Daniel. Daniel is actually one of my favorite uh, biblical figures. The story of Daniel. I'm going to give you some background information about Daniel, okay? 
When you read Daniel, don't just read, okay, this is Daniel. It's a guy who lives in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Crazy name. No, it's very, very, very deep. What had, what had happened up in Daniel's life, let me give you about two minutes of history, okay? What had happened in Daniel's life was this. Jeremiah had been coming to the Israelites for 23 and a half years and said, you have got to stop worshiping these idols. For 23 and a half years, I have been begging you people to stop. But the Lord has not, or I'm sorry, you have not changed your hearts towards the Lord, and He is going to judge you. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, came down and circled Jerusalem. No food went in, no trash came out, and basically they starved to death in their own walls. He breaks through the walls, goes in, finds most of the people dead. The ones that aren't, he kills. And the ones that are good enough, handsome, young, intelligent, capable people, he takes back to his kingdom. The very first thing he does, a welcome home ceremony, is he castrates them. Ooh, dead serious. That was very common. If you're going to be living in the courts of the king, you're not going to be sleeping his, with his concubines. So the very first thing he does is he castrates them. Just like a gelding horse. A horse that has not been castrated is almost impossible to break and to ride. They've just got a mind of their own. You castrate them, they're just a different animal. Same thing with a man. I can make a lot of marriage jokes, but I'm not going to. Same thing with a man. And he knew for a fact, these guys will be unruly in my kingdom, and that cannot happen. Welcome home. Go see the doctor. And David had been living in this kingdom and seen king after king after king after king come. And finally, by the time we get to chapter 10, he's seen prophecies. He's seen angels. He's seen the hand of God right on the wall. He's seen all kinds of stuff. And what's he do? Chapter 10, verse 7. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. He's seeing an angel here. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I didn't have any strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking and as, and as I listened, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. I passed out face first. And a hand touched me. And it set me trembling on my hands and my knees. And he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed. Okay. Hang on to those words. You who are highly esteemed. If you like to play basketball, do we have any basketball players in here? No? Football players? Okay. I know you guys like to play the guitar. So you're standing up here playing the guitar. And I don't know... Don Ross. You know who Don Ross is? No? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> your favorite guitarist, I'm not sure. Jimi Hendrix comes up to you, pops up out of the ground and says, Hey, man, you can really play the guitar. That's astounding. Where, where'd you learn to do that? Can you teach me a few things? I really got a lot of respect for you and your abilities. What would your response be? Oh, that's Jimi Hendrix. Are you kidding me? You want me to teach you how to play the git fiddle? Are you serious? Okay. Daniel passes out at the sight of this angel, and the angel comes up to him and he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You who are highly esteemed. You ever had an angel come to you and say, whoa, hi, don't be afraid. You are highly esteemed in the courts of heaven. Whenever you speak, everything stops and we listen to your voice. Read what was happening just before that. Start chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, skip uh, through the Pharisees, parentheses, its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat, no wine, touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite. 
his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of a burning or burnished bronze, and his face like the sound of a multitude. And there we go again. I, Daniel passed out, and he said, Whoa, you who are highly esteemed, stand up. Verse 10, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Here's, here's, here's some meat. I want you guys to catch this. Please don't miss it. Please don't miss this part. This is one of the primary reasons you fast and pray, for the things you do not see. Verse 13, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael one of the chief princes came to me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people. You got a glimpse of what happens in the spiritual realm behind the scenes when you fast and when you pray. Fasting is the A-bomb of prayer. Fasting is the magnifying glass of sunlight. Fasting is the microscope that allows you to see cells. Fasting works when nothing else does. Daniel's on his knees fasting and praying, begging of the Lord for 21 days, three solid weeks. He ate bread, water, and veggies. He wouldn't wash his hair. He wouldn't do anything, but he just heard from the Lord. That's all he wanted. And an angel breaks through in his life it says, you who are highly esteemed. I was detained. I was. The prince of Persia, he kept me there. But Michael, the archangel, he came down and he released me. And I'm here to give you a message. When you pray, things happen in the spiritual realm that you know nothing of. When you fast and you pray, angels stop what they're doing and go, can I go talk to him? The Lord stops everything just to listen to you. When you fast and you pray, it's like prayer on steroids. And I want you all to grab a hold of this Lenten season. And if you're giving up chocolate, beautiful. Give up chocolate for the glory of God so that you can die to self and live for Him. Because let me tell you what happens when you fast and pray. Your appetites die with it. You struggle with sex? Can't keep it under control? Go a week without food. I promise you won't be thinking about anything ungodly. Struggle with alcoholism? Go a week without food. Alcohol will be the last thing on your mind. You struggle with being cynical, with flying off the handle. You don't have enough energy to get excited. <laughs> your sinful nature is dead. Peter said it this way, he who suffers in the body is done with sin. It's all of a sudden your sinful nature just goes into dormancy and you can talk to the Lord in ways you never could before. Let me encourage you all. Fast and pray. Church, what would happen to this church? What would happen to our community if as a community here at the Wade Center, we'd set ourselves to fasting and praying for one week? You take this shift, you take this shift, you take this shift. We want to see the Lord work and move in our community and in our hearts. What great things would be accomplished for his kingdom? If we were so sincere in our prayer that we said, Lord, we don't care about anything else. American Idol, who cares? Chocolate, who cares? Food, we don't need it. We want you. You're more important. What great things would happen in our community 
if we were so sincere about our prayers that we said that? I can't imagine. I, actually, I can, and I get really excited. One last example of what happens when you fast and pray. Go to Acts chapter 13, if you still have your Bibles open. One through four. Acts chapter 13, verses one through four. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. When they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, we'll stop right there. When they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, I'm dead serious. If you find yourself in a place where you cannot hear from the Lord, give something up. Chasten your flesh so that your spirit can be freed to hear his voice and pray. I lost my place. There we go. Uh, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they were still fasting and praying. They placed their hands on them and sent them off. Their prayers were answered. Father, we need guidance. We don't really know what we're doing here. We, we, we know that we're supposed to send people out, but we don't know who, where they're going. Can you help us? Because a lot of times when you go into these life decisions, there's no answer in the Word. But you need the Holy Spirit's guidance all the more. That's what fasting does, and that's what this season is about. As you're going through the Lenten season, bear in mind, it's not just about giving up chocolate because that's what everybody does. It's not about giving up sweets because that's what my sister did. It's not about not watching TV. It's not about not listening to my iPod. It's not about any of that. It is about chastening yourself so that you can draw closer to the heart of the Lord and He can draw closer to your heart. For 40 days, chocolate might not be a bad place to start because 40 days is a long time. And I just want to say, if you have chosen to give something up for 40 days, I am proud of you. Don't think because I'm encouraging, to, encouraging you to give up everything but veggies and water or food altogether that I'm not proud of you. I know it takes a lot of self-discipline. But let it be a start to something bigger and better. And if you have never spent time fasting and praying, begging of the Lord's presence in your life, then I encourage you, please do it. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. I only used a couple of examples from the Bible. They are everywhere. Everywhere. And every great leader in the Word has fasted or called for a fast. That is exactly what this Lenten season is about. Let's pray. Father, you call us into a deeper relationship with you. Holy Spirit, you long to speak to us. You long to romance us. And not only, you long for us to speak to you, to hear your voice. And so, Holy Spirit, I would pray you would call your people to give up their flesh, to die to self, so that we can live for you, so we can hear from you, Lord. God, is that you? It's a cell phone. See, we're talking about fasting, folks, and the Lord's coming through. Holy Spirit, I would pray that during this Lenten season, we would be aware of your, your call in our lives and your speaking to us in our hearts. And as we give up things for your glory, for our spiritual, or I'm sorry, for our sinful death, I would pray that we would be alive in you. In Jesus' name, amen.